Hawthorne Health Tech and co-author of the recent book, The Age of Scientific Wellness. So welcome to Modern Healthspan and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Richard. Great to be with you. Thank you. So Dr. Price, so in this book that uh, you published uh, recently, you lay out a kind of a vision for how you see kind of true healthcare as opposed to sick care and how that would work. Uh, could you kind of talk through some of the key concepts from yeah, the scientific wellness? Yeah, definitely. So I think most people, you know, have this sense that our healthcare system is not functioning in a way that we would be uh, really happy with. Mm -hmm. And I think there's kind of maybe even like two different paradigms that people come in under. I feel like if you have a really acute event um, that is life threatening and the healthcare system is able to save you from that, there's a lot of great gratitude and there's a lot of feeling that the healthcare system is doing a pretty good job at that task. Um, but if you come in from the standpoint of trying to improve your health over time, uh, what you will often get from the healthcare system, and you know, we give many examples of this you know, from people's experiences in the book, but everyone's going to have a family member or personal that has had this. You'll come in and say, you know, I'm worried about this issue or this concern. And you'll typically get a response that says something like, well, wait till you have these terrible symptoms, then come back and we'll give you this drug for those symptoms. And so we have a system that's very set up around this notion that you need to have an acute problem and we're going to drug you for it. And there's a few differences from that on the edges, but the basics of the system are pretty much set up that way. Um, and we can get into a number of examples of that as we go forward. So if we're thinking about something that we would think of as a healthcare system set up around scientific wellness, it would look very different. So for example, you would be looking at things like different measures that aren't tests of disease, but that are tests of how well is your body functioning? You know, what is your biological age? It's a very simple you know, first example of that, um, which we can get into. Or you can look at things like um, you know, how well is your body combating oxidative stress? How well is it responding to sugars? How well is it doing? You know, a whole bunch of different things. And what you would be doing is focused on how do I maximize the amount of time that you're going to have healthy and happy uh, that is proactive and not waiting to be just reactive to disease. So it gets us around from a different sort of a model. And this also comes out of an area uh, that uh, I've worked in for a long time called systems biology, where we're also trying to not just look at you know, individual factors, but you're actually evaluating the complexity of the body in a whole, including the microbiome and your genome and blood measures and all these things that we get into uh, in order to have a sense for how do we make that system operate uh, as um, healthily uh, for as long as possible. Sleep is the key to your body's rejuvenation and repair process. It controls hunger and weight loss hormones, boosts energy levels, and impacts countless other vital functions. During the holiday season, it's easy to slip from our health routine and have more late nights and eat irregularly. In fact, drinking more than two servings of alcohol per day for men and more than one for women can decrease sleep quality by 39.2%, according to a study from Tampere University in Finland. But when the vacation season winds down, it's time to get back on track and focus on healthy eating, exercise, and above all, quality sleep. For my sleep, I take Magnesium Breakthrough by Bioptimizers because it contains all seven forms of magnesium. I take it every evening and it helps me fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. Visit magnesiumbreakthrough.com modern and enter code 10 for 10% off your order of Magnesium Breakthrough. Thank you for your support. In the book, you mostly talk about kind of USA centric, but I think this would also be true for most other healthcare systems in Western countries. Yeah, it's a great it's a great point. So the book is a little more US centric, just in the sense that you know that's the system that both Lee and I come up in. Uh, but it is, and it is a little bit better if you have something like a nationalized health system. One of the reasons for that is just economic alignment. In the U.S. system, there's very little economic incentive towards prevention. Like if you're a drug company, the greatest economic value to your shareholders by far is that the whole population is sick and they have to take your pill to stay alive. 
I'm not saying that that's, you know, the goal of all drug makers or anything like that. But if you're just talking about what is the economic incentive, that is it. And if you look at the top 10 selling drugs, you know, certainly in the U.S., that is the model for most of them, right? They treat a symptom and you have to stay on it for, you know, potentially forever. Now, if you look at the European system, there are some elements where it is a little bit better because there is the economic incentives are a little more aligned. The government certainly has an incentive towards prevention that doesn't exist uh, in other pockets. That said, you still don't have the infrastructure completely built for being able to monitor for that style of lifetime health and a deep understanding of wellness. Because part of what we argue in the, in the uh, age of scientific wellness is not only a change to how we deliver medicine, but actually a change to how we go about the process of developing the science behind the uh, development of those medicines. So for example, uh, if you look at something like the genome, we treat the genome very much as a way that we have studied disease. I'll give an example. So uh, this is a group, uh, there's a group of uh, Native American, uh, Native American tribe that uh, exists outside of Seattle. And they've been studied for some years. And, you know, there's papers that talk about their diabetes genes. And so they have genes for diabetes. But of course, they don't have genes for diabetes. They have genes that are adapted to a lifestyle that they've lived for a long time. And they're very good at being adapted for that lifestyle. But they're often called diabetes genes because we uh, study so much of what we do in science from the lens of the disease. So there's this flipping point between the notion of, you know, that's a diabetes genes versus, oh, your genome is actually telling you about what's the best lifestyle that you can live that will be in alignment with making your genes function properly. Because all of our genomes are evolved from, you know, in the context of some particular lifestyle that they are well adapted to, for example. So, so there's just a, a flip that has to happen such that we study wellness like we study disease. And, and the one, and I was on a panel right before the pandemic with the uh, emeritus chairman of, of Harvard Medical School. And it was interesting that, and I really liked the way that he put this, um, which was that um, healthcare is the only industry that does not study its own gold standard, which is wellness. And, and so that, that, and that pervades a lot of, you know, how this is set up both in the U S and Europe In Europe and in, in the United States, for example, the national institutes of health, right? Every Institute of health is an Institute of, for the study of a particular disease. And it's only been very recently that you could even, you know, get much of anything, you know, around the standard of wellness uh, into there, you know, and I think that other countries have been pretty similar in that regard as well. Yes, that's true. Uh, so you kind of ran some pilots for this, right? Arivale, and, and I think it started out of Pioneer 100 and then grew yes. into Arivale. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about how those worked? What data you gathered? What did you learn from them? Sure. Yeah. So we started, so Lee and I started this project called the Pioneer 100 pro, uh, uh, Wellness Project, and that was in 2013. Um, I guess is when we planned it and then carried it out in 2014. And so what that was, was to try to take this notion of studying wellness uh, and just build a pilot around it. So we got a, ended up being 108 people. We aimed at 100, but a, you know, a few friends and people kept wanting to get in. So we, we added a little bit to it. So it was 108 people. And uh, we they were not selected for any particular disease. We just wanted to get lots of uh, multiomic data, which is, you know, genomes and proteomes and metabolomes. And if listeners aren't familiar with that, it's basically just a collection of you know, all the proteins that you can find in the blood, the small molecules, metabolites, nutrients, things like that, that you can find in the blood, uh, microbiome. So the, the uh, microorganisms that live uh, in your gut in this case, uh, which were taken from a, a stool sample. We did between 100 and 150 different clinical lab measures. So these are the kind of things you might do at your doctor, a hemoglobin A1C for diabetes, a lipid panels, you know, a lot of the things that you would do to try to tie it into health. Uh, and then we had wearable devices back then. It was primarily Fitbits. Um, 
And, uh, you know, that's, of course, evolved over time. And then we had interactions with a health coach. So the idea was that we take all this data and then we identify for individuals uh, what was actionable for their health. And then a health care coach would work with them to have dietary and lifestyle recommendations, uh, supplements, you know, basically anything that wasn't within the practice of medicine, right, that they could do within the purview of, of, of their, uh, their practices. And we took people through this program in the Pioneer 100 for about nine months. And then following a successful uh, pilot, we launched a company called Aravail uh, in 20. Um, from 2014, uh, uh, end of 2014 to about 2019. And we took 5,000 people through this style of program where we would amass this you know, big amount of, of data with them. And the whole premise here was uh, if we could make a huge difference in their lives in terms of their day-to-day -day health, that they would stay with us in this program. And then you start getting this longitudinal data. And by putting that together, you would then understand uh, what you could see about health.